um, let's start from where I left you last time. And uh, I'm going to rewrite the energy that we are studying. But again, I, I want to, uh, to uh, stress the fact that I, I'm working with this energy, but the, the ideas, the tools that I'm using can be applied to a very broad class of signal perturbation problems. This is an example, it's a simple example, but it's uh, from, from the point of view of, of mathematics, it's easy to follow. But, but, but there's nothing particular that I'm, the tools that I'm using are not particular to this model. They are very broad and can be applied to a, a huge number of, um, of, uh, of situations. Okay, so uh, again, so this is the energy. And uh, I've been calling it I epsilon. So that's the integral of, uh, let's see, it's uh, one over epsilon, w u of x plus epsilon plus u of x square dx. And um, we are fixing, we like to fix the average in omega of u, the field u, and we tell it, we say it's m. Um, I'm working in the case where u is scalar valued, although, Everything I'm saying can be extended to the vector valued case with obvious adaptations, okay? But it's just easier to put it in this context. Omega here is, um, it's an open bounded domain in our N. And so the fields U, uh, oh, okay. Remember that we have W, W is a double well potential uh, and basically we are fixing the wells at zero and one. Again, there's nothing particularly special about the wells being at zero and one, uh, but it's just to fix ideas, okay? Uh, and also, all I'm saying can be extended to multiple wells, to 10 wells, 20 wells, N wells, M wells. So, uh, but, but I'm working with two wells right now. Okay. Um, so, so the function u, uh, for this to make sense, right? So for this energy here to, to make sense, in particular, I'm taking the L2 norm of the gradient. So I'm thinking of u here to be um, a field in W12 of omega. Let me just remind you, this is a Sobol F space. And it's defined as being the collection of all U's which are measurable. Uh, so U is going to be in L2 and grad U is also in L2 of omega with wells in Rn. Uh, and this just simply means that, uh, that when you integrate uh, uh, this is finite. And so is this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, go a little bit ahead of myself because eventually I have to talk about bonded variation. And so, um, and so in, in there, the notion of distribution or derivative is important. And, and so is here. So, so you have to think, you have to think about um, rad u as in the sense of distributions, right? So what, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that, um, is that, uh, is that there exists in, in this case, uh, a function f, which is L2 of omega with values in Rn, such that whenever I integrate over omega, uh, the function u times d phi dxi of x dx, that's equal to minus the integral over omega of fi, f has values in Rn, so f has n components, right? 
Um, and this should hold for every phi, which is, say, C fit with compact support in omega, right? And so, of course, if, if U was classically differentiable, right, what you have here is exactly integrate by parts, right? It would be exactly the U dxi of x times phi of x dx if U was classically uh, differentiable. And so, and so this is exactly what we call the partial derivative of, uh, of uh, U, right? So then, um, so, so then in this abstraction, I will say that, um, so we set the partial derivative of U to be exactly this function fi, right? So, so this is typical. Uh, that's uh, basically the basic notions from the theory of distributions, right? So it's in that sense that we should think about uh, this, this, uh, this, this uh, graded here, right? It's it's in this sense. It's in the sense of uh, of distributions, in that a miracle happens and there is a function fi. That it's uh, in, uh, which is one of the components of the function f is of course has n components f1 up to fm and and somehow you get this identity uh, basically is integration by parts um, and so we identify that in our minds with a classical derivative okay um, and eventually I'm going to come back to this when I introduce uh, the, the space of functions of bounded variation. Okay, so um, so it's in that sense that we that we interpret this energy here uh, again with this constraint uh, m uh, as usual should be a number between the wells so that it forces you to have a mixture between the two phases. You cannot have pure phases, just entirely pure phases. Um, and last time we we said okay, so there is one thing that we need to do. Next, which is to prove that um, uh, for fixed F, for fixed epsilon positive, uh, we are going to use the direct method of the calculus of variations. To prove, to prove existence of minimizers, minimizer minimizers for uh, for I epsilon, and I don't know many actually at the top of my head I don't know any uh, existence result existence of minimizers result in the cox variations that does not use the direct method that's basically how you start okay so so uh, let's stop for a moment let's forget about the epsilon and now i'm going to talk about and introduce the direct method in its full generality and then of course we come back and apply it to our setting okay so so let's have here direct method of the calcs of variations. And it goes like this. So um, you have a functional, let's call it I. Uh, you have uh, a topological space. V with some topology tau. This is a functional. Uh, actually, 
uh, if you wish, uh, you can even extend this to, um, well, let me keep it like that. Uh, so ties of topology on V. Uh, so this is a functional. And what we want to do, so the goal is to prove that um, that I can find a, a minimum uh, a functional, if you wish, uh, there exists uh, a U in V such that uh, I of U is the minimum of I of V over the space, okay? So in our case, our V is what? Our V in our case is going to be uh, W and two with uh, with this constraint, right? So it's all those functions W and two that satisfy the average is equal to this number M, which I give you, which is basically I give you two cans of fluid, uh, can zero, can one, and I'm telling you that uh, can one has uh, the volume fraction is M, right? That's all I'm saying. Okay, uh, so there are three steps. Step one, step one goes like this. Uh, you're going to uh, consider minimizing sequence. There's always a, uh, an infimizing sequence. There's always an infimizing sequence, right? So let me call it Qn. And what it means is that uh, the if, I'm not saying it's a minimum because I still don't know there's a minimum, right? I'm trying to find there's a minimum, but, but if uh, could be minus infinity, okay? But there's always an if. So the if, and you can always realize it as a limit, right? Of an infimizing sequence. Okay, so far so good. Uh, okay, step two. Oops. Somehow you have to use the properties of, of your space, the properties of your energy to show that this is actually what you call compactness. I'm sorry, let me go back. Is what we show. That's what we call, that's what we call compactness. Prove that. Prove that UN admits a convergent subsequence. Uh, so let's call it the uh, UMK. Uh, so there is some uh, U in your space such that UMK in tau with respect to that topology tau goes to you. This topology tau could be uh, could be induced by a metric, could be induced by a norm, could be a strong topology, could be a weak topology, whatever, it's a topology. Okay, um, then you prove step three. You prove, okay. that your energy is uh, sequentially lower semi-continuous. In other words, i.e., if you have a sequence Zn, if Zn i in Z, if Z is in V, uh, then 
i of z should be below limiting of i of z m. Okay. And then I claim that um, then I claim that uh, I'll come back to this, then uh, there exists um, uh, or I should say then uh, a second here, then the U that I found here, remember there was uh, on step two, this U, it's indeed a minimum. Actually, it's a minimum now, right? Because it's a time. Okay. A couple of remarks. Uh, usually, uh, we'll get step two from uh, coercivity conditions, growth conditions of the energy densities that you have, and you use functional analysis to prove that you have compactness, right? You use Barakalo glue or something like that. And usually the crux of the problem is step three. And that's the one that often it does not work and you have to work a little bit more. But before going that there, let me just tell you why is this true? Why, why, why do I have this punchline, right? So that's the why that I'm gonna do now. Why? Well, so it's a basically, it's a one line proof that one, two, and three imply the box, and it goes like this. Okay, so the if, oops, I keep doing this. So the if of I of V with V in V by step one, that was my infimizing sequence, right? Step one says, oh, this if, I just take an infimizing sequence, there always one, got multiple probably, pick one and that gives the info. Okay, so that was step one. So that's the limit as n goes to infinity of i of u m. Well, but, but if I extract a subsequence, the limit does not change, right? So that is the same as if I take the limit with respect to the subsequence, the converging subsequence, which I found on step two. Maybe the full sequence does not converge, but I can extract a subsequence that will converge. That was step two. Okay, so this is step two. Okay, but now, uh, well, a limit is the same as a limit if. And now I can use step three that tells me, oh, every time that I have a convergence of the fields, the energy is lower than continuous, right? So that's bigger than or equal to, so that is now step three. I of u, right? Oh, but wait a second, because I of u is certainly bigger than the inf, right? It's an admissible field. So, so, so you're done, right? Because the inf is trapped between I of u and I of u, it better be equal, which means you have a minimum. Which now becomes a minimum. And that's the proof. Okay? That's how with steps one, two, and three, you can get minimum. Um, okay. So uh, and now you may ask, okay, so suppose that um, okay, let's let's look at with an example. So um, example for step three. Let me take, for example, V to be uh, L2 of omega. Uh, and let me take I of V to be just the L2 norm. Gets V. The L2 norm square, okay? Now, if you have a sequence 
Uh, well, let, let's look at step three and also step two. I want to do both. Um, so suppose that I have a sequence uh, that it's bounded. Okay, so you have a sequence whose uh, L2 norms are bounded. So we know from the theory of LP spaces that there's a subsequence which converges weakly in L2. So there's a subsequence. Maybe not a full sequence, but there's a subsequence. And there is a certain V such that the NK converges weakly and weakly you, you, you use the notation of the half arrow in L2 to V. And let me just remind you what that means. That means that every time that you test it with another function in L2, the integral of VNK of X times phi of X dx will converge to the integral of V of X phi of X dx. Okay, and so you have, so this is our topology, right? So, so, so tau here, which comes directly from inspection of the energy, we cannot do much more than working with L2 reconvergence. So tau here is the L2 reconvergence. Okay. And it turns out that, um, that uh, every time Uh, okay, for simplicity, let me make a non-negative function because our phi here is going to be just a square. If phi is convex, and let me remind you that a convex function is one such that phi of theta, uh, okay, no, that's not what I, uh, no, that's not what I want. Um, what I want is this. Okay, phi of theta say uh, z1 plus one minus theta z2 is below theta phi of z1 plus one minus theta phi of z2. This should be true for all thetas between z1 and one, z1 and z2 in R. Right, so basically, you know, I mean, uh, you have a, a convex function and basically at every point you take the tangent hyperplane and it's to one side of the tangent hyperplane, right? Uh, okay, so if, if you have a convex function, then every time that you have a sequence Zn that converges in L2 weak to Z, you have weak lower semi-continuity. Okay. And a little bit of PR here, uh, Giovanni Liani and I have a, a book in Springer where we, we study all these, in our, all the Cox of is in our P spaces and these results are all there. Okay. So that's good news, right? Because in our case, our phi here, here, our phi is the square, the square is convex, right? Um, and so indeed, the integral of the limit, which we had up here, it was this V here. is below the limit is. So this is a very easy uh, example of a lower semi-continuous um, uh, energy, uh, which is just a square, it's just the L2 norm squared. Uh, 
uh, but of course can be much more complicated. In particular, you could replace these, uh, the norm square by any convex function here, any convex function there, right? So you could, you could have a, a phi of Vx here, and you could have a phi of Vm x squared. Actually, it was, I had a k. So this is, uh, okay, so this, that was a subsequence, and that's a subsequence here. Okay, now, uh, the warning here, is that usually, in general, step three fails, and that's actually what renders these minimizing problems interesting, which is that um, you need to work harder. Your energy in general is not uh, lower semi-continuous. Um, in that case, what do you do? What you do, so, so, so if that's the case, what you need to do is you need to relax that's what we call relax. And there's a whole theory of relaxation. You need to relax the problem. And you do that by uh, replace, replace the, your original energy by its relaxed energy, which is defined as follows. And I'm going to use R for relaxed. R of U is now the if over UN of the limit if, as n goes to infinity of I of UN, whenever UN converges with respect to your topology to you. So what do you do? You look at your target U, you look at all possible ways in which you can approach U via sequences, take any, take the limitive of those energies and then infimize of all possible ways that you can approach U. That gives you something, I'm gonna call it R of U. And it turns out that now this one is, um, is indeed, sequentially lower semi-continuous. So you apply the direct method of the Gox variations. To now the new, the new uh, R. So this will give you some U uh, R of U is the minimum of all R's of V. And it turns out that um, you may lose uh, you may lose uh, the uh, the minimum for for, for the original uh, energy, but what you know is that the if of your original energies uh, is actually uh, is actually so so this allows you to calculate explicitly through r you can calculate explicitly this if you want so why is this uh, and, and just with the, with the cartoon i want to tell you suppose that basically what we are doing is if you have a non-convex uh, energy what i'm doing is i'm convexifying it like so So this basically would correspond to my R. This would correspond to my uh, uh, I. 
And depending on the constraint, it could be that I would find the, the R of U somewhere here, which of course is not the value of I, right? That's the point. Okay, so, so why is that? Why is that now, I'm using red. So why is that? Okay, I don't have, a, I may not have a minimizer for the energy, I, but I have a way of calculating it because R has a minimum and, and, and the, two, the two numbers are the same. And why is that? Well, again, it's a one line proof and it goes like this. So the inf is always bigger than or equal to the inf of the Rs, right? Why? Because I is always bigger than R. You see, in the definition of R here, I can take I can take UN identically equal to U, right? That would be a perfectly good sequence approximating it's constantly equal to U, right? If I do that and if I plug it in this formula, you will see that R of U is going to be I of U or less, right? Because I may find better sequences than U itself, right? So, but if I take this one, you get immediately that R of U is always below I of U just by taking the sequence U, 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 U all the time, okay? So that is always true. The relaxed energy is below the original energy. It can touch at places, but it cannot be more than that, right? Okay, so, so that's what I wrote just here. Uh, then, okay, but now, remember this is uh, now is equal to, um, it's, it's actually minimum because of the direct method, which I said is this R of U. Okay. Um, okay, but what is R of U? R of U, you go to the definition, is the inf of the limit inf of I of U n whenever U n converges to U and you minimize of all possible such sequences. Oh, okay, but wait a second. Give me any such sequence. This object here is going to be bigger than the inf, right? So then, so is this. And so is this, right? And we are back to our situation where you have if and if with R of U squeezed in the middle, they have to coincide. So if I pull this star, oh, I'm using some funny, it's this one. Okay, so that's usually what you need to do. You need to relax the problem. In our, with our energies, our epsilons, we are so lucky that actually everything will go through. We don't need to relax, but I'll, I'll explain to you why. Okay, so let's go back to uh, our energy I epsilon and let's see how we are going to apply the direct method to get a minimizer U epsilon for epsilon fixed. It's up to, I still have 15 minutes, right? I think it's up to- yeah, Yes, yes. Right. Okay. Okay, so um, back to I epsilon. Again, remember I epsilon of u is the integral of one over epsilon, w of u plus epsilon rad u square, and I am fixing the average, some number M. Um, you fix epsilon positive. 
and the claim is that I epsilon admits a minimizer, which I'm going to call U epsilon. We've been calling these minimizers U epsilon in the past two classes. Okay, let's use the direct method. So let's start with step one. Step one, I'm going to consider an infimizing uh, sequence. Epsilon is fixed, n is varying, okay? So uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of i epsilon of u epsilon n is the inf of um, i epsilon of uh, say uh, v, where v is in w12 and the average of v is n, right? This is our space. It's our space v. Okay, so, so that's basically what I've been calling space. Okay, now you may recall step two. Now step two is compactness. You may recall, and I think it was lecture one, Then I took an ansatz, I, I, I took W to be U square one minus U squared, I think. And I proved that, um, I proved that uh, the, uh, I proved that the, the if, Um, was I uh, bounded by, I don't know if it was in this way that I wrote it, but it was something similar. Uh, I called this a number M, which I proved was um, finite, right? You may recall that I had a, a specific construction for this. And I called it the number M. I said, well, okay, if I, uh, I know that basically these, these infimum don't go to infinity, they stay bounded. They are non-negative, of course, because everything is non-negative in my energy and they are bounded by it. I, I call that the number M. But the, uh, I, I repeat, the value of M is totally irrelevant. It's just that it doesn't escape to infinity. Okay, it stays bounded. Okay. Uh, so now, I need to prove that uh, my sequence, uh, so what we need to show here is that uh, in step two, is that I can find a subsequence, let me call it um, UNK epsilon. such that uh, this converges in some sense to uh, some u, and u is in the right space. And at this point, I didn't tell you yet what is tau, because tau, you, we are going to find what tau is. It depends on how, where can we find compactness. That varies from problem to problem. So I'm going to see from from this knowledge what kind of what is the natural topology that i should be working with so in step two step two is the one that identifies the topology okay uh, i don't know a priori what kind of topology i should be working with but i say okay 
So what I know, all the, all, the only thing I know is that um, basically that um, for n large enough, it's an infimizing sequence, right? If I take one over epsilon, w, u, n, epsilon, plus epsilon, broad u, n, epsilon squared, uh, this should be say about m plus one, right? It's an infimizing sequence. So it kind of approaches the infinite, right? Okay, so, so let's be generous and put the plus one on the right. Okay, because you have that. Right? Remember, remember that you have this. That's an infimizing sequence. So in particular for this epsilon, uh, I should, uh, okay, so, so uh, I'm not being very consistent here. Um, let me, uh, we prove this for any, say, delta positive, uh, because my epsilon is fixed here. For every delta positive, the if of delta is finite. So again, you can assume that the epsilon is small, And so, so that for epsilon small, you can assume that you are in this condition, you fit in there, and then you have an infimizing sequence. So, okay, you're close to M, M plus one. And what else do you know? And you know, you have that, and you know that the UN epsilon, the average is M, okay. Uh, oh, okay, so now, if I look at this bit here with this, I get that then I'm going to have that the soup um, say, okay, for n large enough, uh, say um, soup in n for n large enough uh, of say uh, grad u n. Uh, is it bounded by M plus one divided by epsilon. Epsilon is fixed, it's not going anywhere, okay? Uh, what's moving here is M. Uh, and, okay, and we have the second condition. Okay, so at this point, you remember uh, the theory of subolar spaces, you're going to invoke Poincaré, Wittinger, inequality that tells you that that the integral over omega of u and epsilon minus the average over omega of u and epsilon should be a y a square the x is bounded by a constant times the gradient square. Oh, but this is bounded by, you have it right there, this is bounded by this constant C that multiplies M plus one over epsilon. Oh, but this here, I also know what it is. This is a number M which is fixed. So that's gonna give me a bound on this piece, right? Triangle inequality. So uh, the supin n or m large of the integral of this is also finite. I don't care what it is, but it's a finite number. You just put the m on the right hand side, the triangle and call it. Okay. Aha. So what so so what do I have now is that I have that the supin n for n large of the integral of u n epsilon plus grad u n epsilon is finite, right? Because I already had this one bounded and now I got this one bounded. So the sum of the two is bounded. So in other words, what we are saying is that our sequence has w n two bounded norm and again, you go back to the theory of subolar spaces, and um, and the theory of subolar spaces tells you that there exists a subsequence 
Oh, I'm not being good here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. This should be, okay, mess. This should be U, N, Epsilon. Sorry, I'm not being consistent in my notation. Uh, and this should also be U and Epsilon. And this should be Epsilon. Um, right, so it says that there is a subsequence in K, and there is a U in W12 such that uh, U and epsilon k converges weakly in w12 to u and this actually gives you two conditions uh it goes back again to three of subway spaces on one hand you're going to have l2 strong convergence In norm, right? So this goes to zero. And the gradients converge weakly. I already told you before what that is, but I write it again. Okay, and the good news is because you have strong convergence in particular, if I look at the, the average of, uh, of U, uh, let me start with of, of U, right? Uh, and I'm going to add and subtract the, inter oh, let me write it like this. So I write this as um, right because the the U and K option satisfy the constraint. So this is equal to uh, the integral of the difference, right? And so uh, by Cauchy-Schwarz, I will get something like integral of u minus u and k epsilon square to the one half times the measure of omega to the one half, right? But we have strong convergence, right? Remember here, this goes to zero strong. So this goes to zero. So this goes to zero and you conclude that indeed, uh, oh, this should be times measure of omega, right? Uh, so this, minus m measure of omega is zero. In other words, your u is a very good field. It satisfies the constraint. The constraint is admissible. You wind the space v, right? So that was step two. Step two is to prove that we take an ephemizing sequence. You can extract the subsequence with something on the chat. Does you depend on it? Oh, yes, you will depend on epsilon. Yes, absolutely. This is all for epsilon fixed. So. So what you got here, and maybe I should write it here. Let me say it's a, a, a U epsilon, 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 epsilon. This is for epsilon fixed. What's moving here is N or K. Okay, so that was step two, right? That I could extract a subsequence which was converging in some sense to uh, to a U which was admissible. It is, it's W12, it has the right average. And with this exercise, I know now what is the topology tau, right? The topology tau is, so we got, so U is, U epsilon is admissible. And tau is the weak topology in W12 in the sub space, right? Which some people also call it H1. That's just notation, but H1 and W2 are the same. Okay, um, 
And now we should go to step three, but I reach my time. So maybe it's a good place to stop, but next time we start on step three, okay? So I'll close here. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, 